Hey guys, Henning and Morton from Flip Normals here. And in today's video, we are gonna be showing you our top five hacks. These are little tips and tricks that you really shouldn't ever do, but they're really nice. They can save you a ton of time. They can really get you out of a pickle once in a while. So let's get into this very cheeky video. So before we get into our top five hacks, we just want to quickly tell you about the Black Friday sale where all products are currently 50% off on flipnormals.com. So hack number one, this revolves around not rendering out at the correct resolution and rendering at a quite a lot lower resolution. This is awesome because it obviously saves your render time, but it also means that you're rendering at a lower resolution. So let's look at this scathing example here, where we have two renders. One is rendered out at 1920, and another one is rendered out at 1400 as a width. The difference between these two is that. <laughs> one has been scaled up, this has been, this has been scaled up to fit this. And with the UTM compression, I am certain <laughs> can't see anything. This is why when you see 12 year olds having console debates online about uh, resolution and downscaling, 900p versus 1080p, it literally doesn't make a difference. You can get away with quite low resolutions um, and just scaling them up, especially when things are in motion, that becomes even easier to, to sort of get away with. This is what, what I do a lot of my times where a lot of what we do is is for YouTube, where particularly due to the compression, you, you just cannot tell. Like you can probably render at 720 and scale her up and you'll be mostly fine. But even for some more high level stuff we're working on, render it out and then at a lower resolution, save significant render times and then just scale her up. One of the reasons as well is that you have to blur your renders just a little bit. One of the reasons why your CG renders will look so CG is because they are perfectly sharp. All edges are razor sharp. So what I tend to do is I tend to go into filters, blur, Gaussian blur, and just like add like a nice <laughs> just little, a little just fifteen percent, <laughs> but something like zero point three to two, maybe one, depending on the resolution. If you're yeah. doing something like full four K, one might be better. But it's it's subtle enough, but where it just softens everything out. This can have a dramatic impact. So if you are determined to blur your renders anyway, yeah, you might as well just render at a low resolution. Some stats here for you. This one here, which is the lower resolution, took four, around five minutes, four minutes and 47 seconds. And this one took f four minutes longer, almost exactly on a dot, which means that this is almost twice the time to render. So in my opinion, for a lot of the times, you really don't have to render out the full resolution. You can render out a quite a lot lower, lower resolution, scale it up and blur it, and you are left with basically the same results. Yeah, and even if you don't wanna go all the way down to something like 1440, you could do something in between. You could even do lower if, you, if you're really a madman, but it, it, you can get away with quite a lot. So the disadvantage of this is obviously that you're rendering at a lower resolution, which could lead to issues as well. For instance, if you're using a lot of heavy, if you're using a heavy photographic reference and you're projecting a lot of very accurate data onto your models, that might, you might start to see some issues here and there. But in general, I find that it works really well, particularly like Morton said, with, with motion, you cannot tell the difference. Hack number two, do stuff in post. This is the, the catchy phrase everyone of VFX uses all the time as a joke, but not really as a joke. <laughs> no, and this is something we've talked about in many videos before, enhancing your renders and sort of leaving the last part, uh, the last final touches to the very end. It really can help you to just improve some things here and there, add some little pores, just add, so add a little bit of it. But in our case, we're not doing a little bit of post work. We are essentially treating our render as almost as a starting point for a painting with like some lights and the, the sculpt and everything. But in terms of like <laughs> the difference before and after, it's quite significant, particularly for the mouth. You can see that there were some areas here, which I've just straight up painted out like a like a speck I didn't like. And I've added some of the, um, some of the, the drool. And you know, it's not like this here is the cleanest thing, but in terms of in terms of like for illustration purposes, this might work really well. Particularly for the eyes as well. You can see that before it was really dark and it was hard to tell what was going on, but then just, just paint it out. Now I still recommend that you take your renders as far as you can in 3D. I mean for a myriad of reasons. Like it um if you want to change something, it's a lot easier and uh, 
you just have a lot more control. And if you want to do turntables, it's just a lot easier. But a lot of the time as well, particularly if you're rendering from one view, you can control the image so much more directly if you are locking the camera and you're just painting over it. I do this a lot when it comes to projects where I do like temporary paint overs where I, I see how far I can push the render in 3D then I paint over to really push it further because that gives me a good balance between doing it full on in 3D and doing it as, as a full on painting essentially. Yeah, if anyone's watched our Thanos sculpting video, that final still image at the end there, Thanos has been overpainted quite a lot, both using liquify, painting in details that didn't even exist. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. If you're just presenting like one final image, and it's a great way to go about it. So problems with the technique is that obviously if you want to rotate the camera, you have to redo the entire thing. It's very bespoke per camera angle and you can't really change many things, but it can be a great way of uh, improving your render significantly. Hack number three, render out your model using Decim Decimation Master in ZBrush. So, so what we have as our model in this case is we have a sculpt and this has some very dirty topology. This is just straight up zero mesher. And we have a few different pieces here. This is just straight up a dynamesh. But the model, the shape of the model is fine. And the traditional way of doing this, which a lot of people do is they make proper topology and then they make proper UVs, then they export it on displacement map. And now they take this into their software, they set it all up and then they start to render it. That is very time consuming. And particularly for a model like this, which it's, it's a pure concept sculpt. He's not a production model and it never will be. You are wasting a lot of your time. So what you can do instead is you can use a plugin called Decimation Master. It's found on a plugin and you find under decimation master and here you can set a poly count for your model and essentially what is happening is that we've already done it is that it's preserving the fine details and the shape of your model while greatly reducing the actual poly count so instead of going through and uh, optimizing or making the topology nice having nice uvs and exporting displacement maps you just export out the model as a high risk model. This, in this case, is around uh, 300,000 points. And we can bring that into something like Blender and we can render it there. Yeah, this obviously won't work if you're animating something or you have any kind of movement, the mesh actually deforms or to, a, to a certain extent. But if it's rigged and everything in production, you can't do this. But for, but for a lot of static characters, especially environments as well, this is a great way to, it's a great workflow. I, I really encourage people to do this, particularly for showreel pieces. A problem with displacement maps specifically is that it might you might have issues with something like displacement seams. You, it might also increase your render time quite a lot if you don't know what you're doing. So this is a good way for you to bring your models from ZBrush into something like Blender for rendering. Because in this case, you, you can't really tell that this is only 300,000 points. If you if you were to go close up, you can see it starts to break down. But if you're doing some close up shots of this, you just set the decimation amount to be to be higher or rather lower so that you have a higher poly count. So in this case, it's 300,000 and Blender just eats it up. You could easily set this to be like 2 million and it would still look really solid. Yeah, I even use this to my advantage sometimes where I'll adjust the resolution if I'm doing a specific feel for piece, maybe it's a more sculptural kind of piece, I'll actually lower the the decimation amount or increase it, I guess. So I get a more a faceted blocky look. Uh, it's a very sort of, and you get a more distinctive style within your piece. Um, it can be great for, if, let's say you're doing metallic things, you can get that uh, beaten kind of metal someone's been hammering on it or something like that. So you can also use it to your advantage. Hack number four. You can blend between different models in ZBrush using the clay brushes. This is a really cool trick. The requirement for this is that the different models are in the same subtool. So here we have the different models in different subtools. And I want to blend between these two. I just want to not have this hard intersection line. So what we can do, go to subtool, we can go to merge, then we can merge visible. And then we're going to get a copy of everything we have just merged down here. And now you can see it's all one subtool. And if we were to now use the clay brushes, B, C, B for uh, the clay builder brush. And I'm gonna use just a uh, standard alpha. I have alpha 06 for this. And then we can just start to work on top of this. 
This, this is a really cool approach because it allows you to blend between the two. This is not some kind of crazy Dynamesh or Sculptor's Pro trick. This doesn't actually blend it. It just has the illusion of blending. So if we were to check out our topology now, you can see that it's, you know, it's not great, but it means that you can, you can visually blend between models like this which can really help you with different shapes. Uh, an approach which also works with this as well is if you were to now duplicate the model, zero mesh it, and then reproject everything back to it, and then you can truly blend it. But as a, as a quick dirty hack, which is exactly what this video is about, <laughs> this works really well. Use one of the clay brushes, in our case, clay buildup, and just blend between these shapes and you can get really cool results very quickly. You can just see how nice, nice of a line we can actually get between yeah, those. We all know the pain of having two really high resolution meshes and trying to merge them together, doing something with DynaMesh, reprojecting. This kind of enables you to skip that step entirely. Yeah, a lot of the hacks we're talking about now is you know, they are stuff you really shouldn't do a whole lot, but it works. <laughs> but, but they do kind of work. <laughs> Next up, hack number five. This hack involves using a lot of scans as a starting point. Here's a scene that Morton made last year, and it's for a concept piece, which you can see here. So this is a pretty quick piece. You spent how much time on this? I don't know. A few, like an, like an evening or something? Yeah, something like that. And in this case, you can't get to this level this quickly without using scans. Unless you're like some kind of painting savant. Unless you're like that. <laughs> so what's cool is that you can go to different websites and you can get these scans right away. The cool thing is that these are really high quality scans, often straight up out of museums. They might be missing heads and all of that. So they feel very authentic to what you're trying to do if you are trying to do something like this. Yeah, you can see that secondary gate up at the top there. We're just sort of kit bashing scans together <laughs> just to correct. get the exact exact feeling we're after. But you know, this is all about hex. So this was half out of frame and it's kind of dark. And we're just sort of putting things in place that would catch reflections in a in a certain way that that you know I, I was looking for. You can find some of these scans on sites like myminifactory.com. You can also find them on 3dscans.com and you can also find a lot on Sketchfab as well. A lot of these have um, uh, they have licenses which allows you to use them for basically anything. The cool thing about this is that you can download something like the Hellenistic Prince in this case, and you can start sculpting on top of this right away. Like if you if you want to use it as pure kit bash, kit bash like Morton was doing, that's awesome. But if you want to have a starting point for a dog, you might you might want to use this. Somebody has already done a lot of the interpretation for you, and um, you can use it as a starting point for real production model. You got just got to be aware in terms of the restriction and not you know straight up presenting it as your own work, but as a base for something you wanna develop further, I think this is a great way to start. But also, if you're doing something like a concept piece that I did with the Dark Souls thing there, or we'd also done a Death Stranding stream where it was the same approach, where most models were actually found on Sketchfab that Henning is showing. And as long as you're aware of the licensing agreements, uh, everything, every model is different. But if you just quickly check their description, you'll often be able to find if you're able to use it, you know, completely for free or if you need to credit the artist. There, there's a lot of variety out there that you can get for free. So why is this a hack? Because using a scan is a totally legit way of working. Like there's nothing particularly hacky about this. Well, the reason we're including this is because you, the second part is you really shouldn't necessarily use this. And the reason is because if you are relying on scans in order to make your concept pieces, if for environment sculpting or for character art, and you, you need an actual character like this and put some wings on him or something like that, then you are in a lot of trouble the moment you don't have a scan. I really recommend that when you're early on in your career, that you don't necessarily use scans, at least not as a replacement for learning proper figure sculpting. But the moment you know how to sculpt, uh, sculpt the characters, at least you have a good idea of it, and you know how to make the environmental pieces, then it's awesome to do this. Just, just be aware of there are some severe limitations to it, meaning that if you're based your entire career on this and then you don't have a scan anymore, you you won't be able to do anything. Yeah, it can very quickly become a, become a crutch. But for an environment piece like this, where the main focus was really just telling a story 
and figuring out how could I do that with the, the the actual point of this exercise was how can I tell a story in a 3D piece with a paint over with no modeling at all. I think the only thing I modeled was like a torch and that's just a cylinder and that's about it. You also have a very nice plane right here as well. Oh yeah, which okay. I can tell was a lot of work. It counts as, as modeling. So as a CG artist, you do use a lot of hacks and we just want to be clear on that, that these are hacks, meaning that you shouldn't rely on them. It shouldn't be the default way you're working. For instance, should you render all your models as just decimated models in in something like Blender or should you do a proper job and do the topology and all that? Well, it depends on, on what you're doing. But if you want to do anything like proper modeling, you really should learn how to do it properly first and then you can start to optimize your workflow because they, while they while they might seem really useful there was also like a curse <laughs> attached with with using a lot of these hacks particularly something like yeah, just decimating your models and using working based on one specific camera but yeah i really hope you like this video just a quick reminder that again our black friday sale is very much ongoing with 50 percent off everything and if you have any cool requests for videos let us know in the comments and thank you so much for watching and click the little button to subscribe and to be notified every time we put out a new video